I will never forget when someone asked me, what if I miss out on being with my soulmate because I am taking a break to work on me? I think that's a common word. Another flavor of that is, are you the one for me? Today on It's Not You, It's Me, that's what we're looking at. I'm Laura Giles, your host. I work in trauma and shadow work, so naturally I see everything through that lens. I also think that every single one of us is an amazing creature whose role in life is to have amazing conscious experiences so that we have to see all the divine possibilities that we can create as humans. And naturally, we want to have more happy, connected experiences. So if we make wise choices, we have more fulfilling, meaningful lives. And most of us want to have great romantic relationships. We want to have someone to go through life with. So when we say, are you the one for me? I'm not necessarily talking about marriage. I know that lots of people don't want to get married today. I'm just talking about, are you my person? If the podcast entertains or informs you, I ask that you give it a like, share, or subscribe because that's how you show the YouTube and podcast gods that the content has value. So it boosts it up the rankings so that others can find it too. It's free to listen to, but not free to produce. So it's a way to engage in reciprocity and give a little bit back. Now, Jacqueline Kennedy said, the first time that you marry, you marry for money, then love, and the third is for companionship. And that shows growth, I think. But don't marry for love. Marry for compatibility. You have to live with this person, (laughs) and you can't live with everyone. There is way more to a successful relationship than love. We see this in all kinds of stories. We see this in Jane Austen for sure. When the rich girl marries the poor guy and then they have a really hard time because of poverty and that poverty sucks the love right out of them and they end up being miserable. That's one of the ways that marrying for love can show up. But it also has to do with, let's say that I really love this person and they're not that all all that mature. Maybe they can't take care of themselves. So I'm acting as their mother. And I don't want to do that. I want a partner. I don't want a child. Or let's say that they have really bad addiction issues. Love doesn't overcome that. We need to be compatible. We need to be able to spend our time in equality with each other. So my suggestion is to pick the person that you can live with, not the person that you love. Now, you want love to be part of that, but that's not the main thing, I don't think. You you want the big picture. And another thing that I would say is as you're bringing um, yourself into this relationship is to be yourself. Because a lot of times what people do is that they show up like the person that they think the other person wants. And they put on all of these faces. And, you know, so I'm looking like the this girl. I'm the real outdoorsy girl because he says in his dating profile that he likes camping and and outdoorsy stuff. So I, I act like I'm that girl, but I'm really not. I'm really the girl that doesn't like mosquitoes and bugs and I want to be inside in the air conditioning. That's like advertising that you're spicy steak tartare and then you show up as well done and bland. Now, it may not be that obvious in the beginning. But the more comfortable you get with each other, then the more the layers come off and the more that you're going to be yourself, the more they're going to be themselves. And it's going to become really obvious that you're not a match. And so all this time that you spent courting each other and spending all this time with each other is a waste. Because you're acting the entire time and they're acting the entire time. So I would be yourself. That's really the only way that you're going to know if it's a match. You want to do this for them. So that they can make a good choice, but you also want to do it for yourself. If it's not a match and you're yourself, it's going to show up really quickly. So you're not a year into this or five years into this or 10 years into this and be like, oh, this is horrible. I don't like this situation. Not that I don't like the person, but I don't like us together. That's what you're looking for is how do the two of you work together? Now, another thing that I wouldn't do is to say, Let's give this some time. I'm not sure. Let's just feel it out. If that's what's going on, I think you're probably lying to yourself. I think you're setting yourself up for a, this is good enough until the next thing comes along. If you're like, let me feel this out, 
that's not a good match. You already know and you're not listening to yourself. Pay attention to how you feel. If it doesn't feel connected, if it doesn't feel warm, if it doesn't feel good, then I think you're settling for good enough. And maybe that's all you want until something comes along that makes your heart beat faster. If that's what's going on, then what I would do is break off from that relationship and then spend some time developing yourself because your relationship with yourself is far more important than the one with someone else. You want to come into every relationship whole and grounded and knowing who you are. And if you're just like, "Mm, I don't know, maybe you're not there yet. So when I was young, I would go, (laughs) I didn't date that much at all, but I would go out with these guys and um, it'd be like one time. And he'd be like, nope, thank you. Nope, thank you. Nope, thank you. And my brother was looking at this and he was like, you know, you're, you're brutal. <laughs> He's like, do you know how hard it is for a guy to ask you to dance, to ask you out? He's like, you're just cutting them off at the knees. And I hadn't thought about it that way. But what I was thinking about was this is not a match. This is not going anywhere. I don't see myself down the road with you. So why go down this road with you? I think that is much kinder than to just do the, let's see where this goes thing. If you're listening to yourself, if you're listening to your heart, you know, you don't have to spend six dates with this person or six years with this person to know. Know yourself, most important thing. Another thing is when you meet your person. So you're coming to them with your full self and you're allowing them to be their full self. You're gonna see things you don't like. Nobody's perfect. We're all works in progress. We all have our quirks. But if you accept their flaws and love them anyway, and it works with your lifestyle, that's your person. You can pick them. When this person asked me about, you know, what if I miss out on my soulmate? I was kind of like, you you can't really do that because anybody can be your soulmate. If you are the right person, if you're good with you, then you can love anybody. And it's not like, okay, if I pick you, then I'm missing out on something much better. I'm just missing out on something different. So it's not really (laughs) like you're missing out on anything like, oh, it's so important. It's really not. You can love anybody. Now, if you're choosing a partner based on how you feel when you're with them, so the love language, uh, you're making a superficial choice. It's not about who they are, but what they do. You. So it's about gifts, acts of service, words of affirmation, quality time, patch. Those are the five love languages. And I, when I'm doing those things, I do them because I love you. It's how I connect. And if I have to do them to get your love, now that's transactional. I do it for what I can get and not because I'm delighted to be with you and I just want to connect. So it's Valentine's Day and um, I know you like stuff. So I go out and buy you a bunch of stuff. Now that's an obligation. I actually hate holidays because of that. Because it's an obligation, everybody else is getting it, especially Valentine's Day. And it's like, okay, I'm comparing myself to, did did my person give me more than your person? And it creates this, this competition and obligation, which I think is just gross. I wouldn't let your love be about that. I wouldn't let your relationships be about that. Let it be about how you feel. Not about what you do. A person is a human being, not a human doing. And if I need you to pay attention to me, then there's something in me that needs to be fixed about why do I need all this attention? Why do I need all this reassurance? I should be able to love you for you, not because you give me all this reassurance. If I need you to give me stuff, if I need you to say nice things to me, that that's a hole in me. That's why I'm saying when we come to our relationships whole, then we don't have all these expectations and these desires and we can just love each other for who we are and show up how we are. And when our love languages come out, there's a bonus. It's not, I'm here for that. Now, I know a lot of people say that women want security. Sure. (laughs) But if you stop there, all you're asking for is to not hurt. And I think that's a very low bar. I hope that you want more than that. Security is the starting point, not the end point. I hope that we all want and have that. So men too. Nobody should be feeling uh, on edge all the time. Like, oh, what if what if you 
are mad at me today? What if you're ugly to me today? What if you're abusive to me today? I hope that's not happening anywhere. That's what I'm saying. Come to your relationships whole. So look for that security as a baseline. And then what? What comes after that? <laughs> How can I enjoy you? How can you enjoy me after that? Because if I'm in a space of fear, I can't show up as myself because fear puts us in a survival mode. If I'm about survival, you're about survival, then we're clinging to each other. We're not relating to each other. So you definitely want to have that security. You want to have that safety. And that means physical safety, emotional safety, stuff too. And we're all responsible for doing that for ourselves. So Jacqueline Kennedy says we want companionship at the end. So our third relationship, yes. And what are we getting with that? So we're getting someone else's insecurities, their habits, their beliefs, and their life experiences. And we have to be okay with all that they're bringing to the table or else we're going to check out or try to change them. And neither one of those is healthy. So here are some things that you want to pay attention to when you decide, you know, are you my person? So the first is their family. Because if this is a long-term relationship for you, their family is going to be your family. Now, a lot of people say, well, they don't have a relationship with their family. It doesn't matter. They're nothing like their family. Trust me, they are. Even if it doesn't seem like it, the apple doesn't fall from the, far from the tree. And things that are in their family show up in them too, just in a different way. So think about their family. Think about, do I feel comfortable with these people? Can these people be my family? I'm not saying that that is a, a deal breaker. It is an important factor. I've certainly been with people who the family was a no-go, ignored that, and what happened? It was the family <laughs> that, that made it not a uh, relationship that could last. So when it comes to family, they're not going to choose you over their family. Almost never. And even if they do, that thing that they're rejecting, that's part of them, so they can't really reject it. So family is very important. The next one is the religion. And again, people say, well, you know, it's not going to play that big of a part. And if you're not going to have kids together, it may be less significant. But if you're going to have kids together, if you do have kids together, religion could be super important, even if it's not right now. I worked as a mediator and lots of people uh, were fine and they didn't have any issues with religion, whatever they agreed to in advance. That's what they did. And then the relationship broke up. Now the religion became important. So let's say that it's a Mormon. One of the people's Mormon, one of the people's Jewish. And now there's a breakup and the kids go, you know, they're half time with this one and half time with that one. And one of the parents gets together with somebody else. And now it's like, well, we want to put the kids in the Jewish school or we want to put the kids in a Mormon school. If that's not something that you can live with, Think about that before you have kids or think about that before you go into that relationship because that could be a big deal, even if it's not now. I've seen it happen time and time again. So is this something you can live with? Another thing to think about is their spending style. So are they a spender or a saver? Typically, people will get together with the opposite person. So if I'm a spender, my partner's a saver. And now we have arguments all the time. Or I have to sneak what I'm doing because they're not going to approve. And that's not a great way to have a lot of trust between the two of you. So your spending styles ideally should be compatible. And you could solve this by each of you having separate uh, money. In the end, though, you really don't have separate money. <laughs> you just have separate control over I control this much and you control that much. Because the habits of each of you will affect each other. So if I am a gambler and I spend all my money, you're with me. It's going to impact you. Now, I can't show up in a way maybe that's as your equal. And this is going to affect your investments as well. So let's say that, you know, I am the grasshopper. I, sp I save nothing. And we're coming up on retirement. And now I'm depending on you. You're probably going to have a lot of resentment. So even if you have your money, own money. And I highly recommend that you do just for your own freedom and sense of self, feeling like you can come whole and, and take care of yourself, that you're not depending upon somebody, you're, you're an asset to each other. 
that you want to think about this money and, and how your spending habits and their spending habits impact each other. Or let's say that I'm with somebody and, and they make all the money and I have no control over anything. I'm going to feel inferior. I'm going to feel like a child. That's not fantastic. So think about who you are and how you want to be and what can make you show up as a full participant. Think about the money. What does that mean to you? Another big one is communication. When we're talking about are you my person, I need to have somebody that I can talk to and share my stuff with. One of my policies is policy of radical honesty. And that means that if whatever question I ask you, I want to know the honest truth and with enough, enough information that I have the context to make it meaningful. And if I can't do that, then I'm going to feel left out. I'm going to feel exposed. I'm going to feel not safe. But if I do that, I also have to give you the same courtesy. And if I do that, I have to be able to hear you without punishing you. So if you tell me that you went out with the boys after work and were drinking, then I can't punish you for telling me the truth because that's what I asked for. So this requires some responsibility too. Whatever I ask for, I need to be responsible for hearing the answer. So don't ask questions that you don't want the answers to. And this is really important because then if there is any sort of betrayal, you know that it was you that betrayed yourself. And in most cases, that's what's going on. I'm ignoring information that I should have had, I could have had, or I am not paying attention to the information that I do have. That's how a lot of betrayal happens. So another thing about communication is, uh, does this person engage in conflict or do they hide it? You have to be able to engage in conflict because life happens. Conflict is just anything that ends in a question mark. And if I can't get you to answer who's going to take the dog to the vet, that's a pretty small thing. How are you going to answer, are we going to have kids or not? How are you going to answer questions about insecurities and finances and your past history? Everything relies on communication. Trust relies on communication. Con connection relies on communication. And we need to be able to communicate. And a lot of people say, well, we have communication issues. It's just a matter of, you know, helping us with skills. And it's really not skills because most of the time people were able to communicate at one point, And then at some point the communication breaks down. That's not about I forgot my skills. That's not about I just stopped listening. It could be that I'm not listening because I don't feel heard, but it's about we're not relating anymore. We're not trusting anymore. We're not feeling seen anymore. So communication is the top of it, and there's always a bunch of stuff that's going on underneath. So if you can't communicate, if you don't engage in conflict, if you don't share your feelings, you're going to have a pretty superficial relationship. Another super important thing is sex. So how frequently do you want it? So how's your sex drive? Do you want the same things? Are you passionate? Are you standoffish? What are your attitudes? Uh, what are your sexual history like? Is, is your, are you open or are you judgy? These things determine how well you connect. So touch is one of the love languages. And it's really important to get needs met in all five of those ways. And sex is one of the ways that people do that. And if you're not sexually compatible, somebody's going to be unhappy. This doesn't mean that you have to be ready for it 24-7. doesn't have to mean you want exactly the same things, but it does mean that, that it should be satisfying for both of you. And if you're coming to a relationship with um, the desire to not connect, that's something that I would work on. Because sex is healthy, and it is a very good way to connect. And if, if you don't want to touch, if you don't want to, especially if you don't want to touch except if you're having sex, then you're bringing some baggage to the table. So I would get that out of the way so you can come to your relationship whole. Another thing is self-care. Because when we're close, we're close. And if you are not taking care of your hygiene, if you're not taking care of your mental health, it's probably not going to be all that pleasant to be around you. 
So when we're talking about, are you the one for me? I want to be some with somebody that feels good to be around. Hygiene is one of those things. So I'm not saying you have to smell like a perfumery. Hopefully you don't, because that's a little much. But you want to be clean. You want to take care of things. I want to be with somebody that I'm proud to to be with and and feel good about. And the more that you take care of yourself, the more that that's going to be true. Another thing to think about, and are you the one for me, is your roles. Do you have agreement about what, what it is that you're supposed to do and what I'm supposed to do and how we meet in the middle? So for the traditional male-female roles, the male is the provider and protector. The woman is the nurturer. So is that what you want? And if that's what you want, what do you do when you're divorced? Because you got to think about that too. So what does this look like if we, if we were to get separated. Now, if you have kids and you want your partner to be the provider and protector, that might be all well and good while you're together. But if you're not together, is this person going to still provide and protect for you and your kids? How can you be the nurturer if he doesn't? That's why we have these roles so that the children can be taken care of. But the roles are not just the traditional male and female ones. It's, you know, am I the person who is supposed to take care of your emotional needs? Am I the person who takes care of all kinds of things for you? Think about that. Because a lot of our relationships are really about how do we take care of each other. And I think that's a good thing unless we're dependent upon it. If I need you to take care of my emotions, then that gets to be a drain after a while. Because I need you to stand up on your own two feet and do some things. Think about your roles. Think about if they're compatible. Are you on the same page? Uh, being parents is one of them. Do you both want kids? That's a deal breaker. You can't split the baby. <laughs> There's either kids or not kids. And if you have kids with somebody who doesn't want to have kids, that's not a lifestyle that's going to be happy for somebody. Somebody's really getting something that they didn't want. So are you the one for me if you don't want kids and I do? I don't think so. Or vice versa, if you do want kids and I don't, it's a big deal. I'd also think about household chores. Most of us don't think about that. We're thinking about a person. But what does their space look like? If it looks like a hoarder house and you're very neat, you're probably going to be driven crazy by that. All of these things add up to compatibility. and if you don't have a place that feels good in the middle where each of you can be yourself and feel useful and supported, you're not going to be happy. So it's not just about neatness and, and you know, who does what, but about how you meet in the middle. So in, in my relationships, thankfully, it's never been a problem. You know, it, I've been with people who can show up as fully functional adults. So if something needs to be done, they just do it. I'm not going to walk past a full garbage can, and neither are they. So if it needs to be taken out, some, one of us is going to do it. Somebody's going to do it. And that's the way it is with everything. And that's why I'm saying that the more you show up as you, as a fully functional adult, the more options you have. Because you don't need people to complete you. Health and fitness is another aspect of that. So you want somebody who can take care of themselves, who cares about health and fitness. Because nobody wants to be a nursemaid for somebody. It happens. Disease happens. Old age happens. And, you know, if your partner gets Alzheimer's, if your partner gets cancer, that's what comes with it. But these things that we can prevent, we want to prevent them, right? Why, why make more challenges than we have to have? Another important thing to think about is status. So who's on top? I once had this client who was a pretty successful person and he was dating and he kept coming to session talking about these people that he was meeting that were just like not, not what he wanted, subpar, this one has this problem, that one has that problem and he's like blah blah blah, this is so horrible and I'm like why are you fishing in that pond? The only people that you're going to find in that pond are those people. So if you want somebody who is subservient to you, then accept her for that. If you need to be on top, and you want somebody subservient so that you can be on top, 
then accept her because that seems to be what's working for you. But if you want her to be on top so that you can look down on her, that's not fair to her. Think about your status. Think about who you want. And then kind of be wise about that. Socialization is another thing that a lot of people complain about. If you're the social butterfly, you want your partner to be with you so that you're not hanging out there alone. Think about what they want. If they don't want to be with you, you're probably going to be socializing alone. Is that okay with you? For some people it isn't. For some people it isn't. But that's something that people complain about a lot. Another one is drugs or alcohol or so the sense of adventure. How far out there are you? Uh, for the people who, who have this, it's usually, I, I don't really care about that, but I'm not going to participate. So if, if that's you, you know, and you can accept that that's cool. If it becomes a problem, though, that becomes your problem. So think about that, especially if you have kids. Another thing you want to think about is how judgmental they are or how accepting you have their approval and support. So one of the things that neutralizes all of these things is if you have somebody or if you are somebody who's just open-minded and I accept you as you are. So we'll deal with things as they come. And I love you no matter what. That's a really open-hearted way to, to respond to life because life is like that. It's always changing. There's always surprises. Things are going to happen that aren't planned. And if you can come to it with an open heart and love and approval, your life's going to be happier. So no matter who you choose, even if you're way incompatible, I would put that at the top because it's going to make your life better. So big thing is, am I coming to this party knowing who I am and able to support myself? So am I whole? If I am whole, when it comes to are you the one for me, that answer could be yes to a lot of people. If you're not coming to it whole, then the person that you're probably going to attract is the person who needs, who, who's going to push you to be whole. So they're going to challenge you in the ways that make you upset, <laughs> um, unhappy, because that friction is the energy that, that can propel you into finding your wholeness. And I would think of it that way. There's a lot of people who don't work for us. But if they help us to grow, and I think that they can, then the relationship is wonderful and totally worthwhile. The Are You the One for Me is largely about, can I be myself? Can I live with you as you are? It's not really about love. There's enough love for everybody. We can love everybody just as they are. So it's really more to do with having enough shared values and acceptance for each other that we can live together for a long period of time while enjoying each other. So if you want to spend more focused time getting to know yourself and getting in the driver's seat of your life, please join my free community. Make it an everyday part of your life. The link is in the show notes. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Laura Giles. See you next week. Ciao.